Hello and welcome to our latest build video. I'm James Duffy and I've got a great new project to share with you. Just off screen, I have a set of pre-production parts for a new offering from Estes. Now this particular model was a huge surprise for me when I first heard about it a little over a year ago and it is quite unlike anything the company has ever offered before. So let's take a look at the new 148th scale Soyuz booster from Estes. That's right, this is a 148th scale Soyuz. There's no need to check your calendar, this is real. It's not April Fool's Day. This kit was designed by longtime Estes designer John Boren, dare we call him the chief designer, and is produced almost entirely from blow molded and injection molded components. Now my initial impression is that this model blurs the line between traditional model rocket kits, which are usually made from paper, balsa, plywood, and occasionally a handful of plastic parts, and the world of traditional static model kits, which are usually produced entirely from injection molded parts. A couple of comments before we dig down into the kit. First, this is a pre-production kit and some very minor changes will be made to a couple of the components. I'll point those out along the way. That also means that there aren't any assembly instructions yet, just some engineering drawings that the kit designers pass on to the art department at Estes. There's also clearly not any custom packaging yet, nor are there any decals present, or decals if you live outside of the US. In effect, you're seeing a step in the product development process. Next, I should share that I am not an entirely impartial reviewer, as I have a professional relationship with the team at Estes. Still, I'll try to be as impartial as I can. If I hit any speed bumps along the way, I promise to share them. This is going to be a big model when complete, just over a meter tall. That puts it in the same neighborhood as the 1100 scale Saturn V. With the visual bulk of the strap-on boosters at the base, it is going to have some significant presence. I'm going to start with the most unsurprising component found in the kit. This is a section of paper BT-60 airframe tubing. This is exactly the same material found in, say, a Big Bertha kit. It is, by some stroke of divine providence, exactly the right diameter to represent the central core of a Soyuz booster. We also have a 29 millimeter motor mount, and we also have some centering rings made out of plywood, as well as a length of aramid cord for a recovery system anchor. Let's look next at the blow molded parts. There are six of these in the kit. Four for the distinctive strap-on boosters, one for the upper section of the lower stage, and one that represents the second stage in the fairing for the Soyuz spacecraft. We'll start with the strap-on sections. Now these have extensions on both the forward end and the aft end of each part that need to be removed. That's an easy task with a razor saw. The caps at each end are a leftover from the blow molding process. Imagine a cylinder of soft heated plastic, then close a two-part mold around that tube and then pressurize it with air. The cylinder will inflate to fill the mold cavity, which creates the part. After the part cools and solidifies for a few seconds, the mold halves are opened and the finished part can be removed. This is that finished part. It's really no different than how a water bottle is made. This is the forward end of the central core of the lower stage. Again, we've got these caps at each end that we'll cut off with a razor saw. With that out of the way, the BT-60 central core can be inserted into this piece. Now this molding represents the upper end of the rocket, including the second stage, which is roughly here, and the fairing that contains the Soyuz spacecraft up here. There are no ends to remove here. The escape tower will be mounted at the forward end, and a simulated second stage motor assembly will fit onto the back. That's it for the blow molded parts. Next, we have several sprues of injection molded plastic parts, no different than what you might find in a static model kit. We'll start here with the smallest of these, which contain what are called the vernier or vernier nozzles, 
which effectively guide the rocket during the boost phase. There's also some detail parts down here, which will be added to the base of the strap-on boosters. This tree of parts contains the rocket motor nozzles for the strap-on boosters. These butterfly-shaped parts right over here will be mounted to the exterior of the central core and will be the upper mounting points for those strap-on assemblies. These pointed bits down here will insert into the forward end of the strap-ons and will engage with the butterfly-shaped parts. This set of parts include the fins that will mount onto the strap-on boosters, as well as the nozzles for the central core. These four rectangular parts right here will be mounting pads that will install onto the central core to strengthen the attachment of the strap-on boosters. This small detail part right here will be added to one of the cable raceways. We'll see those parts in a bit. And this bit of rod-shaped plastic will be chopped up to help align the lower end of each strap-on booster to the central core. In a separate package, we have two long cable raceways for the lower core. We also have a removable clear fin assembly for flight, as well as a clear launch lug that sandwiches between the upper and lower sections for flight. This is really innovative. It's simple to the point of genius. And like the fins, it's removable for display. This little tiny clear part will be added to the fin assembly to create the lower launch lug. Now, given all of the changes in central core diameters on the model, coupled with the obstructions created by those strap-on boosters and the clear flight fins, there's really no way to configure this model to use rail buttons. So we're going to use a traditional launch rod for initial flight guidance. We also have a number of larger individual injection molded parts. We'll start at the aft end of the model and work forward. These two pieces here will join together and insert into the aft end of the BT-60 airframe tube. The aft end of the strap-on boosters will attach to these pads on that assembly. Note there's little tiny holes for alignment pins. There's a part that will fit into the aft end of this assembly, forming a portion of the motor mount and motor retention system. These two parts will join together and form the motor retaining ring. For display, we have a plate that we can also insert into that aft ring. There are four aft plates for the strap-on boosters, and the rocket motor nozzles we saw earlier will fit onto these. There are six on each plate, four large fixed nozzles and two smaller vernier nozzles that provide the guidance for the full-size Soyuz. Here we have the forward end of the lower section of the Soyuz, essentially the cap for that part of the booster. I'll snap those together real quickly. Now, Mr. Boren has very cleverly turned this into effectively what is the nose cone shoulder for the upper section of the model. This will engage with the lower section of the second stage. Note the locations for these rocket nozzles that are already molded into the part. There are some smaller vernier motors that will fit into these smaller locations. Now, where is the intricate interstage assembly that connects these two components? That's one of the coolest party tricks of this model. Injection molding the interstage as a single component would either be impossible or would require a hideously complicated mold tool with multiple actions and slides and a crazy high price tag. Enter the very first 3D printed resin part ever featured in an ESDAS kit. This assembly fits between the simulated lower section cap and the base of the second stage. Now, is that strong enough? Here we get to have a quick view into the iterative design process of a model kit. These are the original kit parts. The interstage fits between these two. After evaluating these, John decided to opt for something a bit stronger to help take some of the pressure off of the resin printed component. So he modified the design of the molds to allow the inclusion of a small bolt 
that can hide in the gap between the two sections to take some of that strain. It's a very cool design solution. It's pretty clear that the special sauce here is the combination of the injection molded and the blow molded parts. This model should go together very quickly, perhaps in a couple of evenings, which means that most of them will probably get built and flown. On top of that, it's relatively easy to paint, especially when compared to the Saturn kits. By extension, that means that a very high percentage of these kits will be built and very, very few of these Soyuz kits will show up on eBay in 20 or 30 years. So plan accordingly. There will also be parachutes included with this kit. At the time we're filming, the size and type had not yet been determined. So what's our build plan? There are two bits of prep work that I'd like to go ahead and get out of the way. We're going to wash all of the plastic parts with lukewarm water and mild dishwashing soap to get rid of any mold release or finger spoob. This will help make sure that our adhesives and paints will work well. Next, I'll prep the paper BT60 tube by priming it with Rust-Oleum Automotive Filler Primer. This will allow us to eliminate the nasty spiral seam on the tube as we won't be able to reach that elegantly once we get the model put together. I'm only priming the lower 9 and 5 8 inches of this tube as the upper section will be hidden inside of the blow molded lower central core component when everything is complete. I'll do several coats of the primer sanding each with 320 and 400 grit paper. For this build, we're going to use primarily plastic modeling techniques as opposed to traditional model rocket building chops. Again, this model really does veer into that static scale modeling world to a degree that no flying rocket kit ever has before. You'll want to have some quality sprue cutters on hand. Here's a set from Zuron. Here's another from a company called Turbo Dork, and I'm not making that name up. And here's uh, another set. This is a pair of orthodontic wire cutters. They are the best sprue cutters I've ever encountered, if you can come across a pair of those. I'll also be using uh, primarily plastic modeling cements and adhesives. This is Tamiya Extra Thin Cement. Probably 90% of the model will be built with this particular goo and uh, I'll apply that with a simple old brush. You'll also want some quick cure five minute epoxy handy for the centering rings and motor mount. Let's talk about paint real quickly. Now, those of you who've seen my previous videos know that I'm very fond of Tamiya products. They work great, they dry quickly, they're remarkably consistent, and they are readily available. Now, the big finishing challenge with the Soyuz Booster is that no one can tell you accurately what color the beastie might be. Ask a hundred people to identify the color, and a third will tell you gray, a third will see green, and the final third will perceive either gray-green or greenish-gray. We'll dig down on this in a separate painting episode. Now I'm playing with some color mixes off camera, and I'll share the results of that study when we get to that stage of our project. So that's the kit, the new 148th scale Soyuz booster from Estes. I anticipate a really quick build with two more videos. The next one will cover construction, and the final video will feature finishing and final assembly. Thanks for watching.